Welcome into the Reaction Channel, folks. It might be a red day in the market, but it is not for Metastock. Metastock hitting a new all-time high. Got a bunch of things to react to in this video. Meta events going on literally right now. Meta introduced their first official prototype for a holographic set of glasses called Orion. So we're going to speak about this. They put Jensen in the hype video. Stock hits an all-time high. Want to react to that, kind of what's going on there. Mark Zuckerberg is a long-term thinker. Looking forward to reacting to that one. Leon Cooperman, billionaire investor Leon Cooperman, spoke about his feelings on the market, his favorite stocks right now. Obviously, a uh, very big name in the stock market. Leon Cooperman, I would kind of put him as like a, a B tier in terms of famous people in the stock market, A tier being like a Peter Lynch, Warren Buffett, folks like that. Leon Cooperman, certainly a big name. What's he got in the background there? Next one up here, we're seeing people grow more optimistic. Turbochars after that jumbo rate cut by the Fed. So this is interesting because this is something I'm really looking forward to reacting to. I feel that a little bit as well. We're seeing people grow more optimistic. Some of these bears are slowly coming over. So we'll react to that one. Take auto loan defaults with a grain of salt in, uh, as far as a read on overall consumer health. Looking forward to reacting to this one. And the reason being is auto loan defaults just hit a 15-year high. So, you know, some people could... Uh, draw conclusions with that like oh man it's the end we're going to be in bad times um you know this man says grain of salt and so i want to react to that one uh, appreciate everyone joining me meta very exciting day congrats to any meta shareholders out there new all-time highs for the stock in history so very very exciting we're on the way to 700 also today very exciting congrats to the members of my private stock group we got seven new six-figure club award winners so these folks are that just hit six figures plus in their portfolios. We got seven of those new ones. And if you're looking to apply to join my private stock group, that will be the pinned comment down there today. Get access to all my best course curriculums, learn how to scale your portfolio up, all that fun stuff, plus access, full access to 1000xstocks.com. So let's go ahead. Let's start going through this. Uh, the meta event, right, uh, as far as that goes, I might talk about it on the main channel later today or something or tonight. Or, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, uh, the event's going on right now, so, you know, I don't think there's anything they're going to show that's going to necessarily be a game changer for the stock. It's just exciting, right? It's exciting showing off new products and things like that, and Meta's working on a lot. But I don't know if anything's really a game changer in terms of, you know, they show off something and it's like an iPhone moment or something like that, right? But what I will say, and it's very important, everybody understands this when it comes to Meta, is Meta is really, in my opinion, the leading tech innovator company now at this point in time uh, over really everybody else uh, now at this point in time. When I really look at what they're up to, what they're producing with the MetaQuest products, right? When I look at what they're doing with the Ray-Ban glasses, now this holographic set of glasses, they're really pushing tech further and faster than anybody else in tech, right? They're, they're really starting to take that mantle of what Apple was a long, long time ago. And when I talk about Apple a long time ago, I'm talking like 20 plus years ago, right? And they're really starting to take that mantle and really pushing innovation to very high levels and doing things that people are like, wait, what? They got what in the market? Like, that's crazy. They're doing this, they're doing that. And they're not afraid to try new stuff. And, um, you know, it's it's pretty exciting uh, developments, obviously, that are going on there. And the, the problem with a lot of other hardware tech companies is you're not seeing a lot of innovation from those companies. You know, Apple certainly comes to mind. And the reason being is they have such great businesses and monopolies built in hardware that it's hard for them to really innovate at, a, at any sort of big scale. And they also don't have an innovator running the company, right? Tim Cook's certainly no, no innovator. He's not known for that. He's just running the, the show that Steve Jobs really built there and just, you know, making sure they make everything incrementally better and stuff like that, right? So you, when you don't have a visionary leader, at the company, you can't come out with visionary products. That's like, those are freaks, right? Zuckerberg's a freak. Uh, Jensen, who runs NVIDIA, he's a freak. Like, those guys are like one-offs, very, very special individuals. And so you can't just like replicate that with any CEO, right? And Elon Musk, those sorts of guys, like they're, they're you know, Steve Jobs, like those, and there's not many of those guys out there. And uh, so at the end of the day, when you're talking about real innovation, special products coming into the marketplace, it's only gonna come from really those those very special individuals. Let's react to this one. And, and um, to explain a little bit about how and why these, these glasses have kind of become a sleeper hit, haven't they? 
Well, first, I'll start by saying I agree with Barton. I think from a short-term <laughs> perspective, the, the AI story, specifically around advertising and ad efficiency, is enormous. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just infinite 100%. number of wins that will stack up for Meta over the coming, coming short-term years. But Mark Zuckerberg is a long-term thinker, and he's long-term committed. And he's True. willing to be patient through the hard cycles. And so I think we've seen the, the, the Ray-Bans, which are a fabulous device. The first version was okay. The second version is a hit. It's yep. great. I have them. And, I have them myself. You know, this is not a one-cycle story. This is going to be a multi-cycle Is there anybody watching this video right now who also owns the Ray-Ban Meta Glasses? If you do, please let me know in the comments section. I assume maybe there's five or ten people watching this video right now that you own the Meta Ray-Ban Glasses as well. Um, I bought them. I like to kind of just, you know, buy all this new tech that comes out and just see, like, what it's about. Like, I own uh, both the previous generations of the uh, MetaQuest, right, the, which was previously known as Oculus. I usually just buy all this new kind of tech and just try it out and whatnot. And I do have the new Ray-Ban uh, Ray Meta Glasses. But, yeah, if you own them, let me know in the comments section. I'd love to hear from you guys. As it has been with VR over the long, long term. So, again, the way I put it is AI. Or if you don't own them and you're planning on buying them in the next, I don't know, six months or so, let me know that in the comments section. The short term story and AI ads optimization is what matters now. But what you're seeing is a long term focused patient company and a long term focused patient CEO. And you can see that this is just going to grind this all to a really interesting place over time. Oh, 100%. Martin, I think if, yep. you, if we can hear you now, uh, go ahead. We were talking about, you know, is it really the hardware? Hey, why they got Tim Cook on? <laughs> Some of these new announcements that are powering the stock, or is it literally as simple as how AI has been better optimizing their ad load? Sure, um, I think it's the latter. Um, their advertising has been on fire, um, and that's why the stock's been on fire. Um, you know, they're huge and they're taking fire. share, and nobody really does that. Um, and they're crediting AI for improving return on ad spend, for improving user mm. engagement. Um, they're deploying AI and they're kind of a use case of AI improving your business um, that's way ahead of uh, the pack. And that's where the excitement is. The devices, the reality segment, is where the concern is among investors. They've lost cumulatively since they started breaking this out, this segment, 60 billion, nearly 60 billion. Wow. In a case to, to lose, you know, 17 billion or so this year, uh, a little bit larger than what they lost last year. Um, and there's no one on Wall Street who looks at that and says, yeah, you're kind of get a great return on that investment right now. It seems like something <laughs> that a founder controlled company can do. Now, that said, yeah. um, it's getting better. They're losing a lot of money, uh, but the devices are still. That's the other thing. Meta can get away with it. It's a phenomenal top tier point that gentleman just made. 100%. We know Tim Cook is no visionary leader at Apple anymore, right? They're just running off the fumes of Steve Jobs. That's clear. But also, he couldn't even get away with this. You think it would be okay if he spent $60 billion? on you know these long shot projects no of course not because people are gonna be like what are you doing like you're not gonna be able to do this anyways like you're wasting your time and your money zuckerberg you want to spend 60 billion go ahead spend 60 billion like we really don't like it that much but you know what you're zuckerberg you can go ahead and do it same thing with elon musk he can spend what he wants jensen can spend what he wants at nvidia those guys just they get different leeway right they get different levels of respect it's kind of like a quarterback that's allowed to audible, right? And the offensive coordinator calls a play and the, the quarterback goes ahead and audibles it out. If they're really that special, you can say, okay, you know, do what you want out there. And that, that's a situation. So that's another reason why these other companies uh, can't really, even, even Sundar at, at Google, he doesn't have that sort of leeway. Like Sundar can't, can't do what Meta's doing here. Like, no way. They're not going to allow him to. So the shareholders won't allow him to. Like the Ray Bans are interesting. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so that's, uh, I think, why CNBC and others are looking more closely at what they're announcing, because these devices are starting to resonate. And the whole category was really validated to a degree by Apple moving in with Vision Pro, um, you know, and Snap continuing but to leave. In, those in these I mean, I, I take your point about the, the glasses more broadly. We the, the most intelligent thing that Meta's doing here in Zuckerberg, as far as their strategy, with their physical products, like the Ray-Ban glasses, um, like... The MetaQuest products, right? The, the most intelligent thing he's doing is he's keeping price points low. He's keeping price points under $500 for these products, which is, then it's available for the masses, right? When you start trying to charge multi-thousand dollars for these products, you, you're not going to have the demand there, right? People are just don't have that sort of money to spend. So like Apple launched their VR headset, complete biggest flop in Apple's probably history or certainly their recent history. Like what a flop of a product that was, right? 
And uh, it's gotten so bad that, you know, they're not even trying to spend really any meaningful marketing uh, dollars behind that anymore because it's such a flop. It's an embarrassment that Apple came out with that product. And, you know, Apple's always one of those companies that you always used to be like Apple comes out with something. It's going to be big time. They came out with this and it completely flopped, which I told everybody this is going to flop. Like I like it was so easy to, for me to see. And the reason being there's a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the biggest reasons, though, the most overwhelming one, they try to launch it at a multi-thousand dollar price point. Listen, if we're all talking about new tech, who's the people that adopts new tech? Young folks. Young folks that can't afford a multi-thousand dollar headset from Apple. And that's the biggest reason the Apple VR headset flopped in the biggest way in, in Apple's recent history. Like, oh my gosh, is that embarrassing. Uh, I can't think of anything bigger in, in recent times. They, 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 never, they never flop. Like, we're literally, think about everything they came out with. iPhone, iPod, iPad, the MacBook lineup, right? They, they don't flop. AirPods, Apple Watch, they, they don't flop, right? But you got a product there that had nothing to do with Johnny Ive, had nothing to do with Steve Jobs, and look what happened. Flop. It's the product category. For more or less dead, no one was that impressed with what Snap announced the other day. The Apple Vision Pro goggles, I don't think they've been a great seller. And you sort of, Barton, are saying you like the stock in spite of their investment in the, in the glasses and not because of it. But Sam, I would just say, these do feel like a little bit of a breakout hit. What separates them from the other kind of failed eye hardware that we've seen? Um, or are they, you know, they going to be a flash in the pan or really a, a more durable product category? I think it depends on your timeline. You know, look, yes. they've gotten to the point of the consumer device. I climbed the Grand Teton last week wearing them, you know, wow. filming the climbing, listening nice. to music. It's a great experience. I'd rather Boom. listen to music on that. There it is. There's the exactly. That's the point I was just making, right? Zuckerberg's like, we're going to create great products that are super innovative at affordable price points that the masses can actually afford. Apple's over here like, oh, yeah, people are going to spend $3,500 plus tax. Add another 10% on, you're at nearly $4,000 for that Apple Vision Pro. Give me a break, man. Give me a break. Then, um, then I would on earbuds. And they take great photos. Now, is that the killer thing? That, are we there? No. Um, and I think to Bart You know who uses a Quest 3? My kids use the Quest 3. Do I use a Quest 3? Heck no. I've tried it out. Am I interested in using that on a daily basis? Absolutely not. But my kids love it, right? That's who adopts the new technology. The Ray-Ban glasses, I use those. Those are pretty cool. Uh, but at the end of the day, like new tech, it's the young, it's the youngins that always adopt it, right? The kids, the teenagers, people in their twenties, they're always the first movers on, on new tech. Do you think they can afford this price point? Give me a break. For the next several years, the story is going to be AI optimization, which is a massive freight train that Meta is best by far positioned to take advantage of. But again, Mark's in this for the long term. The company's in it for the long term. When you think on a 10 plus year horizon, which candidly, the market doesn't care about. It's too far out for the market to care about. I'm glad they're making these investments <laughs> and I expect to see a lot of success long term. Sam, oh, yeah. is it a bit of a black eye, so to speak, for Apple here that Meta has all the buzz around a headset right now and, and Apple doesn't? It must be driving crazy. I mean, you know, if you think about it. It doesn't drive him crazy. No, here's, here's the deal. Luca, the CFO of Apple, he's about to retire. He's about to go into bye-bye land, right? Uh, the big dog at Apple, Tim Cook, he's maybe got a few years left. The stock's at near all-time highs. He's happy. Uh, he'll probably, I, I would say Tim Cook will probably leave the company in the next two to five years, Right. And he's going to leave at top, on, on, at, at top right? And, uh, and so I don't think they're really worried about that. They're going to have a mess to clean up long term with Apple. When I say long term, I'm talking 10, 20 years from now. But that's not going to concern Luca, the CFO. That's not going to concern Tim Cook. They're already going to be long gone from the company. So I don't think it really actually drives them crazy at all. I, I just don't, right? The employee force, does it drive the employee force crazy at, at Apple? Probably not. I, I don't think... I think they lost a lot of their innovators years ago. A lot of them ended up actually going to Meta, to Tesla, and to other companies, NVIDIA. So I don't even know if they have that many people at Apple's workforce that really care like that in terms of like, let's innovate at the highest level, let's push the boundaries of what's possible. I don't think they really have that anymore. They launched the Vision Pro with enormous fanfare. It was supposed to be Tim Cook's big win. And, you know, they, they couched it in being like it's not a consumer device. But look, I have one right next to me. Um, I think it's probably the most expensive device per minute of consumer use in history. No <laughs> one uses these things. Yes, and um, exactly. Meta, on, meanwhile, when you put their headsets on and they've just ground, they continuously grind and grind and grind. They're making them better and better. I'd say they're already better than the Vision Pro at a tenth of, a tenth of the price point. You know, this is going to be a long, hard fought battle. But Meta is incredibly well positioned and it's a huge black eye for Apple. Yeah. But like I said, I just don't think... 
if Steve Jobs was still running that company, one, they wouldn't be in a situation. Two, they would actually care. They would have the employee force, Johnny Ive, Steve Jobs, those guys would not uh, be happy with everything that's going on there. But I don't, I don't think they have that. Uh, no, no, it's just a big bureaucratic company now. It's got a monopoly market share. They'll just, you know, it'll, it'll uh, 10, 20 years from now, we'll be talking about Apple's troubles, but it's not right now, right? For now, they got the iPhone ecosystem. Meta is going to disrupt that huge over the next 10, 15 years, but it's not over the next one or two years, right? And so Apple's good for at least the next few years. And then we'll see problems emerge in Apple longer term. But that, you know, once again, the people that are running Apple, they're not even going to be around at that time. So all they care about is making sure that stock price is at all-time highs or near all-time highs when they go ahead and leave this company the market and the heights of the market for some time. You've been warning that, that things could take a turn down and that you are less optimistic than others. We keep hitting new highs and I just wonder when you think things would potentially be offset. I know you're still not convinced that uh, good times are here to stay. Yeah, well, I'm very concerned about two things. One is uh, the debt buildup. You know, we have two candidates running for office. Neither one it talks about the deficit uh, or the buildup of debt. Preach. You know, in 2017, I think our Preach. national debt was $20 trillion. And seven years later, it's $34 trillion. <clears throat> that's a growth rate far in excess of the growth rate of the economy. And that's going to be a problem one day. We don't know the day, but it's going to be a problem probably when we least expect it. And secondly, I would say, which kept me involved in the market, is after 10-year bond belongs to 3.76 where it is currently, there's very little in the market that's overvalued, unless the 3.76 is reflective of a coming recession. And um, if it's 3.76 X recession, there's very little that's overvalued. You know, I go back to 1972 Nifty 50, when uh, the, the market is selling at a much bigger multiple than it's selling at now, and the ten and the ten year government bond was six and a half percent. And in two thousand, Cisco, which was the then present day NVIDIA, was selling three hundred and eighty times earnings. The ten year government in in two thousand was uh also six percent. So at three point seven six there's nothing that's overvalued. Or very little that's overvalued. So has the Fed cutting rates pushed you into a position where you're going to be putting a lot more into stocks? No, I'm reasonably fully invested, but it, you know, I'm, I'm invested in offbeat merchandise. I have a 20% position in a bond that I think the government's behavior is disgraceful. I discussed about it before. It's a little complicated. I have about 15% energy. Given what's going on in the Middle East, I would think energy uh, would be a place to have some money. And then I have a lot of special situations. So, you know, uh, I'm not sitting on a lot of cash. And I think the Fed cutting rates is cutting rates in the short end. And I think the long rate is going to go up. The 10-year rates are going to go up as the Fed reduces short rates. So you get back to a positive slope fuel curve. Does it make sense to you that the Fed cut rates, uh, just looking at where you see the economy? Yeah, I would say that the short rates are too high relative. You know, uh, historically, the 10-year government bond is yielded in line with nominal GDP. So if you have real growth of about 2.5%, you have inflation of 25 that would be 5% nominal GDP. So the 10-year would not be uh, overvalued at a 5% yield. Uh, and it would be undervalued. I think the rates are going to go higher. In the short end, you know, maybe you get 125 basis points over inflation. So the rate doesn't belong at the current level of 5%. I agree, 100%. So I, I think the, the Fed will cut short rates. But it's not going to make much of a difference. You don't use a yep. short rate to discount a long duration asset. Yep. So your concerns about when we will have a problem on our hands, just in terms of when people won't buy the government debt, um, as you said, it's probably coming at the the time we least expect it. How do you prepare yourself for that? Well, uh, you know, I think. Look, I may be too old. You take me out behind the barn and shoot me. I'm 81 years old. Uh, I've been through a couple of, uh, you know, bubbles, uh, 2000 bubble and a 1972 bubble. Uh, and a bear market, who he who loses least, loses, loses, wins. So I would think that it's going to be hard to prepare, though I think stocks are the best place to be. I would avoid bonds. Uh, 
and uh, you just don't know the timing. You just don't know the timing. You know, uh, in nineteen. 19- so I, I got to be honest. Leon Cooperman brings up a phenomenal point there, right? In, in terms of bear markets, it's important. Whoever loses the least wins because. At the end of the day, when you do go through those bear markets, everybody loses. Everybody's going down. But as far as who wins in those bear markets, it's whoever goes down the least, right? And additionally, who wins the most coming out of those, whoever was buying the dip. And a lot of times, it's the hardest hit stocks. So you look at, let's say, 2022, for instance, right? If you were positioned going into 2022 in a lot of more value and dividend stocks, you held very good in 2022. Like those stocks didn't get hit nearly as hard as let's say tech stocks. A lot of tech stocks down 50, 60, 70, 80%. But coming out of there, where was the most money to be made? It was in those tech stocks. You should have been buying in 2022 Meta, Shopify, Netflix, all those sorts of stocks, right? Tesla, Nvidia, AMD is a long list of them. That was where the most money was to be made coming out. But when you're going through it, like it's it's really like you, you pointed out there. It's really about who loses the least, right? Twenty two, two very civic minded citizens, Pete Peterson and Henry Fowler, used to run full page ads in the Journal and the Times, alerting the public to the evils of the budget and trade deficit. And here we are, what uh, fifty years later, and the only significance has been that we have the lowest interest rates in our lifetime. Now I, I don't think it's sustainable. You know, uh, we had in the uh, 70s the concept of guns and butter. We have guns and butter now. <laughs> We're assisting in fighting two wars, and no one's focused on reducing the deficit. And uh, we're going to hope that we have crowding out. That's my view. So I'm, I'm very concerned. I'm concerned about the election outcome. We've got two people running for election. I don't hear either one of them talking about uh, the need to deal with our fiscal issues. You know, we we got to finance these wars. It's, uh, we're not thinking about it. And whether the market forces us one day, who the hell knows, but I think it will. And so that uh, leads to my conservatism. Not outright bearishness, but very conservative. I think the market at 21, 22 times earnings is fully valued and does not allow for the uncertainties that exist. That's my view, but I'm finding plenty of things to do in the market. I'll be honest with you. I find plenty of things to do. But everything I look at uh, leads me to be cautious. You know, everybody talks about stock repurchase. And I would just observe, but the wise man does in the beginning, the fool does in the end. How many billions of dollars of stock do you think Intel bought back? How many billions of dollars of stock did Bed Bath & Beyond buy back? That's true. You know, Intel point. is now on government assistance. Yep. And, back, true. and uh, you know, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, the great retailer, Preach. Uh, is in bankruptcy. Preach. So there's no magic... You know, you, you only make sense to buy back your stock if it's cheap. Yep. And if you're so far into a bull market, maybe and your stock isn't cheap, maybe you're making a mistake. Preach. Lee, why don't we 100%. talk about the things you are finding to do? If you've got 15% in energy because you worry what... Like RH, for instance, is a good example of a stock that I, I couldn't believe they did that that insane buyback, right? Um, and so I love RH, the company. And I believe in this one, but I, I hated the buyback they did, right? The CEO, I mean, he does this buyback, a uh, ridiculous buyback uh, was a year or two ago, right? And, um, you know, put the balance sheet in a very, very bad position. RH hasn't even really been making any substantial profits recently. So you got a business model that's going through very tough times. They put their balance sheet into a crap territory all for a buyback. And it was like, if they would have just kept all that money on the balance sheet, they would have had tons of interest income coming into the company. It wouldn't be seen as nearly as risky of a company, right? And they wouldn't be able to weather any storm. And now RH is in one of those positions where they really need the housing, the high-end housing market specifically, because that's what benefits them. They really need the high-end housing market to come back strong and fast the next two years, or they're going to be in some dire problems. Like when I say dire problems, I'm talking like stock goes down to like a hundred dollar level. Now if the high-end housing market comes back boom in the next couple of years. Well, RH will be looking good. But you can't always count on like being bailed out by you know something like that. And so, yeah, I agree with him in regards to a lot of these buybacks these companies do. A lot of times they just blow their money, man. They blow their money on these buybacks, and it's like, shh, <laughs> like you know, you just better hope you don't go through hard times because then you'll be wishing you had all that money instead of doing share buybacks. Putting in the Middle East and and think that that will potentially drive energy prices higher. Where where are you looking? Where have you invested the most? Well, I have two large positions in two Canadian oil and gas companies. Paramount Resources, we've been going for a while. 
stock yield 7%. Uh, they have virtually no debt. Uh, they're uh, producing oil at $31 a barrel, and they're following a strategy of increasing production. So they're going to go from 100 to 1,000 barrels a day of production to probably 150,000 over the next few years, bringing down their average cost of production. So you have a debt-free company with a current dividend yield of about 7%. You know, I find that's better than cash. And uh, another company that is written, run by a very smart guy, uh, Michael uh, Rose of uh, Tourmaline, you know, one of the largest oil and gas producers in Canada. Stock has a fat dividend yield of over 5%. Uh, and uh, run by a very smart guy. And uh, I would think that given what's going on in the Middle East, there's a risk that oil prices move higher than we think. Um, one that I have a very big position in, but it's complicated, is a company called uh, Legato, which I've talked about in the past. Sure. This, uh, this is a travesty of the U.S. government in terms of their behavior. These guys have $40 billion of assets that you can create in the market for a billion dollars. At the end of the day, they're suing the government for $40 billion, and I think that their lawsuit has a lot of merit, and I think the bonds are totally That's mispriced. So, you know, something I think that's very important we all learn from a lot of these older gentlemen, right? Um, these kind of like legendary investors that built up incredible amounts of wealth. What we see time and time again from them is they become disconnected from newer companies, right? And newer technologies and understanding those business models and those sorts of things. And so we're all going to age. We know that, right? We're all going to age over time. And so I think it's as investors, it's important that as we age we don't become so disconnected from the new companies that IPO over time. We do research on those companies, find out what's going on with their business models, what makes them special or not special, really look at their competitive moats around those companies, really really understand their CEOs of those companies, right? And so, and same thing with new technologies, like really look into these, see what makes them special, what makes them not special, right? And uh, really do the research work because I think a lot of these folks, they reach kind of a certain age and they just stop kind of even trying in regards to understanding newer companies and newer business models. Because it's not like a lot of these guys, do you hear them ever owning like Meta? <laughs> do you ever hear them owning like Uber, right? Or NVIDIA? Like a lot of these older guys, they just don't because the, that technology is so disconnected from kind of whatever their reality was back in when they got in the market back in the 60s, back in the 70s, back in the 80s. And now they look and they're just like, it's like a foreign language to them. So us as investors, as we age, as we get older, because that will happen, right? We've got to make sure we stay, understand these technologies, what's going on there with these companies. So then we don't get left behind when it comes to the next big opportunities, right? Because as a younger investor, you might understand Meta Perfect. You might understand Video Perfect or whatever, right? AMD, whatever. But what about in 20 years from now, 30 years from now, with new business models that you can't even imagine today, right? Will you be able to understand those? That's where a lot of research work has to come in. And you can't just kind of like throw in the cards and say, I can't understand this. So now all I can buy is, because a lot of these guys, what are they stuck buying? They're stuck buying like a lot of energy companies, like oil and gas type companies, right? Like you don't want to be stuck just buying those sorts of stocks, right? Or buying bonds, like, geez, that's, that's brutal. That's brutal, right? So... We got we to gotta stay on it. All right, next one up here. We're seeing people grow more optimistic. Titled, People Are Growing More and More Bullish. How can they be more and more bullish? They've already been bullish for the better part of two to three years now. Oh, no, sir. No, sir. Just because the market's gone up does not mean people have really been bullish, okay? Bullish is a term that's referred to not just in terms of how the market's doing, but additionally, it's a term that's focused on how are people feeling about the market? Are people feeling very optimistic, right? Um, you know, when, when these folks go on to CNBC and these Bloomberg and whatnot, is everybody talking about, you know, we're going to moon? Like, is everybody kind of in that Tom Lee type thought process or are we in, in something different, right? And I just can tell you, as somebody that watches a lot of CNBC and, and Bloomberg and reacts to clips all the time on this channel, like almost on a daily basis, what have I heard for the last two years? I've heard a lot of people kind of in the middle, kind of meh on the market. I've heard a lot of people be bearish for two years, right? I will say I, I'm hearing more people kind of either go from bears to neutral or neutral to bull. But 
you know, I, I, we can't act like everybody's just been bullish for the last two years because that's not the reality. That's right. We are seeing people grow more optimistic about this rally. I think we've seen a lot of people take a sunnier outlook on stocks for a lot of this year, but that optimism was kind of turbocharged after that jumbo rate cut that we saw by the Fed. We're seeing the VIX fall to its lowest level of the month. We're seeing other measures across markets from high yield bonds to derivatives show that people are really positioning for this rally to continue. All right, so if that is the case, that brings into mind all of these elements about complacency and this idea that people don't care. And when they don't, that's when the bad things start to happen. How do you reconcile that kind of market dynamic? I would say looking across the market, people are not concerned about a drawdown right now. We saw the ratio of put options to call options traded yesterday hit one of the lowest levels of the year. Again, the VIX is down. Yields on high yield bonds, which are the most sensitive to how the economy is doing, are at some of the lowest levels since 2022. So we are seeing people pile into that soft landing trade. And of course, you could argue now everyone is on this side of the trade. Is that when things fall apart? But look, the data has held up so far. And I think that's why people are going to be keeping an especially close eye on things like inflation and spending this Friday and jobs next Friday. So let's take a... I don't know if we can really give this whole everybody's piling in, right? The Russell's not even at an all-time high right now, right? When that Russell breaks through that 2300 level and we go to an all-time high, I can tell you that will be a moment where we start to feel like, oh, the market's actually like, like really starting to feel bullish, right? But it's hard to say the market's feeling that bullish when the Russell is down on a you know three and a half year basis, roughly, right? Or a three plus year basis. I mean... That's hard to say that, right? Whenever you have an index that's negative on over a three-year basis, it just doesn't give the best feelings of like super bullish, like markets. Like if Russell goes to 2,500, Russell goes to 2,600, okay, now we got the vibes. Now we got the feeling of like, oh, we're really in a bull rally. At 2,200 on the Russell, it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel like it. We're, not even, we're lower than we were three plus years ago. The word of the day in your mind. What is it? You kind of alluded to it already. I, I get a sense for what you're going to say. The word of, my word of the day is calm. I think, you know, there's been a remarkable calm out there and people are positioning for this really placid stretch of trading to continue. I mean, take a look at what's happening ahead of the opening bell. We're down like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 percent. And people just aren't positioned for turbulence ahead. There is just not a lot of fear out there in the market right now. How do you... I mean, I, I, I could make an argument that people may actually be positioned for turbulence. We have record, and not just record, but by far and away record amounts of money on the sidelines, right? Money market funds is, is by far and away the highest we've ever seen it. So there is a lot of money out there in case the market does fall. So that that's something just because people aren't playing put options heavy, that doesn't mean people aren't positioned. Cash is another way to position for downside in the market. I look at this and I say, we have JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon talking about this notion of rising risks in the geopolitical sphere. We've also got a presidential election coming up that could... Even myself, I have a lot of cash on the, on the sideline. When I say cash, I'm really talking about money that's in savings accounts or CDs that's yielding in that 4 to 5% range right now, right? That it's over there just in case. And just in case something happens here. I'm ready to rock and roll, baby. Like, send the S&P down 20%. I'd gladly take that. Or even 10%. Like, let's go. I'm ready to rock and roll, right? I think there's a lot of me's out there that either have some portion of cash on the sideline or there's other folks that honestly have ridiculous sums of cash on the sideline, right? That really sold heavy, um, you know, at some point in the last year or two because they thought something bad was going to happen or the end of the cycle, those sorts of things. And those people are very heavy cash. And they're kind of like waiting for this market to go down. Like, come on, go down. Like, September seasonality, October seasonality. Like, it's got to go down. And they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And they're hoping. Um, and they're still hoping. It's be a catalyst for volatility. We've got a fourth quarter shopping season coming up that could be a referendum on the strength of the U.S. consumer. Yet, as you point out, the VIX languishes. What exactly is happening and why are there no concerns about for all these potential catalysts coming up? I think a lot of it does come back to the Fed, right? And I, and I think a lot of people were encouraged by this 50 basis point rate cut, which was much more than a lot of people expected. And when you take a look at the data going back to the 1980s, stocks and bonds typically do do well. 
after the first Fed rate cut. And I think there are some warning sounds, I, uh, warning signs out there, including in the consumer confidence data yesterday. But it hasn't been enough to move the needle in the other direction. And again, I think a lot of people got the recession trade wrong the past two years, and they're almost afraid to say it now. Okay. That, that is, is, is going to be the scenario that, that we are dealing with. There has to be a sense then that if there is a leadership regime, they are they have been wrong. Like like they, they have been wrong at the end of the day, right? And, and so, but once again, with the recession crowd, they just kick the can down the road. So, if you didn't get it right this year, you push it to 2025. If it doesn't happen in 2025, you push it to 2026. If it doesn't happen in 2026, you push it to 2027. And eventually, you you're you're right, right? Oh, the recession it happened. It just was four years after I thought it was going to happen. Right? <laughs> like, come on, happens. It could be a broadening out of this market rally that we've been talking about. Is it going to be a broadening out trade? Do you see that kind of in the fund flows data? Do you see it in the options market? Do people believe that the market can do better without just leadership from the magnificent seven? I think that's already been on display, right? Take, I mean, after NVIDIA's last earnings report, we did see other corners of the market pick up some slack and just take a look at trading this week. It's been the energy sector, the material sector leading the way. Caterpillar hitting a record high. McDonald's hitting a record high. That is a broadening trade. That is, you know, the corners of the market that are most sensitive to the economy doing really, really well right now. All right, next one up here. Auto loan defaults hit a 15-year high. Take auto loan defaults with a grain of salt. This should be an interesting Milestone one. Milestone with a grain of salt. UBS head of credit strategy, Matt Mish, joins us now. How, how severe are these are these delinquencies? Well, I think, you know, <clears throat> certainly you've seen two things that I think are notable. One is um, we're not just talking about subprime ABS delinquencies anymore uh, that are near elevated levels. We're talking about prime, right? And about 80 to 85 percent of all auto loans uh, or financing for an auto purchase uh, essentially are prime. The second thing I would say is that, again, these levels have been uh, certainly elevated uh, relative to the last, call it, three to five. By the way, if you're wondering why is Tesla holding up so well, uh, given that everything else is getting absolutely wrecked in the auto sector, 1010. 1010's coming. And, and so there's a lot of hype that's going into 1010. So that's why the stock should show strength here in the short term. After 1010, we'll see what happens with, with Tesla stock over the next you know year or so. But going into that event... There's a lot of excitement, so it's going to be really difficult to get Tesla down before 1010. Let's just put it like that. Years, but what we've really seen is a notable uptick. And again, you are approaching uh, 2009 levels. Now, having said that, we do think that investors should take this with a grain of salt, particularly in terms of the read for the overall consumer health. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is that net losses are not keeping up at the same rate as the delinquency surge that you're seeing. And a lot of this, we believe, is due to something called churning. Uh, that's when consumers miss a payment uh, or two on an auto loan and then start to repay. And so there's some underlying fragility, but ultimately consumers want to keep the car um, and are basically uh, making payments uh, after missing a few. The second I would just say is that non-revolving credit growth remains fairly strong through July uh, it ticked up a couple of percentage. Now, in regards to the auto loan rates going up so much, it doesn't really surprise me very much. And, and the reason being is, you know, if we really go back to 2021, 2022, there was just so many uh, credit was obviously very easy to get. And then obviously all the stimulus money, PPP loans, all those sorts of things. A lot of people bought autos that honestly probably shouldn't have been buying autos. And, and obviously this year has really been the year that you feel the uh, negative effects of all that after inflation, right? To about 5% year on year and revolving credit growth as well is also fairly stable. Um, and the last point really is <clears throat> that overall, we believe that auto loans account for about 9% of household debt 4% of bank loans in the U.S. And so you okay. know, this is an area 4%. where obviously, you know, crises don't strike twice, so to speak. Housing is not going to be the problem. Uh, the areas that are of concern uh, are really consumer loans within household credit. And, and autos is certainly as well as credit cards uh, in, you know, in, 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 uh, in focus right now. And those aren't as bad. Is that what you're saying in terms of delinquencies, defaults? Those are not. I mean, mortgage delinquencies are increasing, but still about a standard deviation below average. And keep in mind that mortgage credit is about 70 percent 
of total household debt. And so, you know, from our side, what we did was downgrade um, our view for high grade and high yield auto credit uh, to underweight. Uh, but we didn't necessarily change the overall soft dish landing that we have on the consumer uh, because I think it's too early. There's enough data points that suggest this is not uh, necessarily, as you say, a, a canary in the coal mine that investors should seize upon. Still, it's a risk. And I, and I do wonder, Matt, if you see it priced into the financials at this point. I remember that ally warning a few weeks ago at the Barclays Financial Conference of, of credit challenges, especially tied to autos, is, is in the banks. Yes, I think, you know, from our standpoint, we downgraded the high yield financial sector to neutral. Um, I think you have to separate banks from the rest of the financial sector. But I do think that there'll be some challenges going into third quarter earnings. You know, we've seen that with uh, some other cyclical uh, uh, names like KB Home Overnight. And so, you know, I, I do think that if this is a credit cycle as it normally plays out, where those areas that are more vulnerable start to deteriorate and deteriorate first, certainly higher beta or lower quality credit uh, or names in the stock market. Um, in those areas that people are looking for more pressure, again, within household debt, we would say it's not going to be mortgage credit this time. It's really going to be consumer credit. Um, these are areas that uh, you would expect, and I think we will see some pressure uh, as, you know, as we go through the next few months, particularly given while the Fed is cutting, you know, interest sure. rates are still restrictive. All righty. Appreciate y'all joining me as always. Thanks so much for being here on the Reaction Channel, folks. If you're looking to apply to a private stock group, private wealth group, that will be the pinned comment down there. Learn how to scale up your portfolios and all that good stuff. Alrighty, much love and have a great day.